second here. Uh, I'd like to thank Daniel for those uh, 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 incredibly kind and uh, comments and, and uh, memories and, and uh, description of uh, some experiences. Uh, I, I, I would also like to say, uh, in teaching over 36 years, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, a student like Daniel end up in a good spot and, and doing uh, good critical work. Uh, it's really uh, an honor for a teacher or an instructor to have uh, students uh, continue to develop critically their work and, and to, in some basic, very basic sense, make uh, common intellectual life uh, improved uh, uh, or even better than that, transformed. So again, uh, let me thank you. Uh, I, I should give a little bit of background uh, in terms of this talk. This is part of a larger work uh, called The Black Book of the Arts and Humanities. Uh, uh, everyone reads it, you know, any of the editorials or the articles in the New York Times and other places, uh, let alone the vast number of books now out on the parallel state of uh, education in the United States is aware. There's a lot of trouble uh, having to do with institutions. I, I saw editorials last week where the New York Times or uh, that August uh, institution itself is recommending that people consider whether college is worth it from a financial point of view. For some of my peers, this is just a, a nightmare that we're having this discussion. But it's going to happen, and, 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 and as we all know, institutions uh, are under uh, extraordinary competitive pressure uh, uh, to sustain their own reproduction as well as very basic functions in society. All right, that, that given, that, that, that's just, that's a common context I think everyone understands in contemporary society. In terms of my own, my own angle or, or approach and method and attitude uh, toward this, um, I, I deeply respect the works of what it has broadly been called modern French theory. I, we could rat all agree and disagree and rattle off the names of the authors. You know, Roland Barthes, uh, starting in the 1950s, when he be, begins as a critic to argue that uh, criticism is a, a, a dead end because society is a blind alley. Uh, and, and for <coughs> 60 years or so, there's been a continuous uh, stream of criticism from uh, writers like Barth, Michel Foucault, Gilles Deleuze, Eric Gray, and so on. I don't have to enumerate all of them, but it's a consistent tradition. And it has to do mostly with the status of criticism in an advanced or mature society. Uh, what is the status of criticism from an intellectual perspective? Now, there is no department of criticism in the United States. Uh, there are history departments and English departments and so on, but there is no particular place for criticism. And one of the, one of the peculiarities of trying to do criticism is that you immediately uh, appear to people that you have no territory uh, to, that you own, and you have no, therefore, no product uh, will directly result or be the, the consequence and the outcome uh, of critical work. Now, for someone like me, that's a very good thing. Uh, because crit criticism is more important than any particular academic specialization. Uh, or to put this in terms that, that are increasing now from areas like intellectual property law, ideas and concepts uh, can't be owned. Uh, in Corrine McSherry's work, uh, a very brilliant book called Who Owns Academic Work, published four or five years ago, uh, she notes, uh, radically so, that intellectual property disputes uh, are in taking place in society over, over such things as copyrights and, the, and reproduction rights and so on. But in fact, concepts and ideas uh, can't be owned by anyone, and therefore this gives to academic life a, a kind of strange relationship to, well, why do we have these territories? Why is the past owned by historians? <clears throat> why is the truth of literature owned by literature departments? Why is the sense of art history owned by art history departments? And so I just want to say that one of the things I've tried to do, uh, and I've worked in history departments, I've worked in critical studies departments, uh, is, to, to, is to keep a certain kind of distance 
from specialization, but understanding that I must not violate the knowledge actually produced by the specialists. So what I'm trying to do, and have been trying to do in a number of ways, is to respect specialist knowledge uh, insofar as it's critical, but at the same time, uh, uh, keep opening up a sense of criticism uh, in society. All right, Those are just, that's just context. Uh, my title is Criticism in an Age of Anti-Intellectualism, question mark. Uh, but the question mark at the end of my title isn't coy. It raises a subject which is at the intersection of academically driven artistic endeavors gathered at institutions such as galleries, publishers, schools, and the like. I am affirming that academic politics often goes with a certain kind of high-brow anti-intellectualism. One has to be precise about this. The stupidities of a Glenn Beck uh, type anti-intellectualism don't come from someone uh, who wields any intellectual authority. Instead, I'm concerned with the institutionally based anti-intellectualism. So anti-intellectualism can mean censorship, which I'll get to in a moment, or it can mean subtle disavow. disavow. Richard Turnament. Uh, brilliantly showed that academic departments can control their programs simply by not funding a job or area of study, uh, simply by omission. A genealogy of the concept of omission might open up some startling things. For example, the eminent journal History and Theory has never published an essay on the historiography of Jean Baudrillard, and what the journal doesn't cover, in this case Baudrillard, is reduced in importance. A few years ago, the MLA announced it was no longer accepting uninvited submissions. And last year, the journal Boundary 2 announced the same thing. Instances of what Foucault called domination, where, quote, knowledge is formed via observational methods, recording techniques, procedures, verification mechanisms are more important than ideologies, close quote. This is an important argument that Foucault made. Ideologies are less important than the procedures of making, producing, disseminating, articulating, omitting, and so on, intellectual work. Foucault went on to argue, quote, war is the motor behind institution and order. In the smallest of its cogs, peace is waging a secret war. Peace itself is a coded war, close quote. Uh, Foucault was, a, of course, a, a, a master at, at whenever we thought there was some secure territory or stable area, he would go in and show there was combat or confrontation or some other uh, more volatile or less volatile sense of war. Uh, in this sense, the subject of anti-intellectualism belongs to a kind of adversarial biopower understood through material operations and forms of subjugation. Uh, in Foucault's own work, he located this uh, in the emergence in the 17th century in what today we would call counter-history. Uh, and he located this in the, the writings of the French aristocracy, which was wanted, of course, to have their own power restored against the monarchy. And he argued that uh, in, in the 17th century, that this counter-history drew its elements from the prophetic rather than the sovereign demand, that it was more mytho-religious than Roman, more from the Bible and poverty and insurrection, uh, and managed to put how the mighty in power conceal the contingency of injustice, the history of betrayals. In short, in, for Foucault, in all matters of intellectual life, there are dissymmetries, disequilibriums, injustice, and violence that runs beneath the law. Here are marker for authority, justification, legitimacy, and the like. In, a, in other words, uh, 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 conflict is endemic to intellectual life, and anti-intellectualism is also co-coded with uh, virtually every form of intellectual life that we could understand. Now, in a larger sense, then, the argument is that universities belong to this sense of combat, war, conflict, and to procedural management uh, or institutional control, 
which of course in, in American society involves supplying the labor force uh, as well as reproducing itself. Uh, I take it as a, 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 as a strange but uh, actual fact that last year in the United States fewer than 1,000 PhDs were granted in the entire country in all disciplines of history, uh, which is a, from 30 years ago is a real collapse among historical uh, departments or history departments, but we don't see the historians fighting about this. The historians have accepted their kind of shrunken head uh, position <laughs> in, uh, if I can put it that way. <laughs> they, they've accepted their, their reduced importance in society, but this is the way they maintain control over their own job markets. <laughs> From an intellectual perspective uh, on this, I'm then interested uh, uh, to see uh, from a Deleuzian perspective that in, in, in complementary with Foucault's sense of war, uh, Deleuze argues that marketing has, uh, has now captured concepts uh, in the very act of, quote, product displays, historical, scientific, artistic, sexual, pragmatic, and the event has become the exhibition and the only concepts are products that can be sold, close quote. In other words, uh, uh, anti-intellectualism is embodied in the products that can be circulated, and of course the products that can't be circulated in society are regarded as worthless. Uh, Deleuze continues, we pass not only into uh, what one could call, quote, the simulacrum has become the true concept, close quote, but into controlled knowledge of the very conditions of all of us. While there's a, a large of literature now on <coughs> academic life uh, uh, in, in the United States and Europe on, on the, what you could call the global education complex, the fact is it remains uh, uh, restricted to specialist literature. There is, in fact, no general social understanding whatsoever of academic life in a society which prides itself on its academic institutions. That, that is a kind of conjunction uh, of production and anti-intellectualism. In any case, anti-intellectualism is a series of practices that gravitate around credibility, institutional expansion. Uh, my example for that is the, uh, the building of the new Guggenheim uh, in the Middle East, largely built on slave labor from India and Thailand. Uh, and the controlled subjective expressions. Uh, in Writing Degree Zero, 1953, Roland Barth noticed that even among progressives, quote, the function of writing is to maintain a clear conscience, its mission to identify the original fact with its remotest subsequent transformation by bolstering up the justification of actions with the guarantee of its own reality, close quote. In other words, uh, uh, the kind of writing that we identify with uh, books uh, is less intellectual as it is confirmative of existing uh, agendas, ideologies, political positions, uh, political oppositions, uh, things we should all hate, uh, everything we're supposed to and so on and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, what, am I, what am I saying? That, uh, bo books have become feel-good things? All right, maybe. Anti-intellectualism as writing was, for Barth, the safety of writing, the exact opposite of criticism, writing that moves existence to the non-personal. In, in, many, in many of the, of the French theory writers that, that uh, um, I've stolen everything from, uh, the, the movement to the non-personal, away from your social position, but rather to what does the writing do? What does the representation manifest? What is the effect? Uh, criticism has to move to the non-personal, or the Lewis called it the impersonal, or the apersonal, rather than uh, giving agreement and comfort to existing positions. For Deleuze, anti-intellectualism was amalgamated to stupidity. What's stupid, he argued, is to make the new the unrecognized, the strange, the ambivalent, the weird, paradoxical, 